There you go. All right. And are you able to see my screen? I am. Perfect. So, as David mentioned at the very end of our presentation, there will be a short survey. We actually read those. And one of the comments that have been mentioned is we would really love some one-on-one -on -one content kind of going over, you know, how do we get started with availability groups or availability, high availability features and which ones, you know, are good for us. So that's the whole premise behind go ahead and doing this webinar for you today. So yes, we do read those and actually apply the content and try to make this virtual chapter better for you guys, the attendees. So David did a great job of introducing me. Um, like I said, just a guy who loves SQL Server and loves helping people solve their business problems with SQL Server. So here's our agenda for today here, the next 40 minutes or so that we're gonna go through. Even though we're talking about introduction to high availability, a common misunderstanding is that high availability equal, equals disaster recovery. We're gonna talk a little tiny bit about disaster recovery so you can clearly have a good understanding that those two are not exactly the same thing. You know, high availability is keeping data online, whether that data is good or bad. Um, so that's a key thing that we're gonna point out in one of the disasters we're gonna talk about. So you can make sure that your high availability solution not only keeps your data highly available, but can also protect you against some disasters that might come up. So from there, we're gonna to touch up into a nice one-on-one section talking about pros and cons between all of the high availability features built into SQL Server, like log shipping, database mirroring. Um, we'll talk a little bit about transactional replication, uh, failover cluster instances and always on availability groups. And then at the end here, we'll get through your questions that you have. And if we don't have enough time to get through them all, I will definitely take some time to go over and make sure that we get those to you as well. So first, uh, let's take a look at an example of a disaster. So recently, I took my family on a nice summer vacation out to Galveston and I have a good friend that's also in the SQL Server community that's out there. So we talked a little bit about Hurricane Ike. So while you can plan for a disaster, it's always great to make sure that you actually have tests that's going through your disaster. Because if we just look at Hurricane Ike, my friend told me some interesting stories that I personally wouldn't have even thought of in regards to a disaster like this hurricane. So for example, he mentioned that, you know, unless you had a boat, you really couldn't get to your property for a little over two weeks. And even if you had generators, um, you know, if they needed gas, well, guess what? You really couldn't get gas at all as well. So you definitely wanna make sure that you test whatever features you're using to make sure they actually give you the coverage that you need. So now we talk about the disaster of a hurricane. Let's talk about one of the most common technology disasters that will constantly reoccur. And folks, so this is as simple as writing a delete or update statement where you have a filter and you may have just not highlighted that filter and ran the query and now you changed more data than you expected. Um, this is a disaster that a lot of DBAs, data professionals, make at some point in their career. Um, some may refer to this as stress testing your recovery process. But the whole point here is as we look at high availability features, you know, some of them that you may use will keep this bad data change highly available. What does that mean? It means that this delete statement will happen on your primary copy of data and get shifted over and also be on your secondary copies of data that you want to use. Um, this is why we're going to talk about some of the interesting pros to log shipping as this can really help you against that problem, especially if you have a very large table that may be in a database that would take a long time to recover by going through the stores. So, we talked about two kinds of disasters. So the main thing I want you to take here before we get into all the features is that disaster recovery doesn't equal high availability. Remember, high availability is keeping data highly available. 
if we just had that second disaster and data that you didn't mean to change changed, it can easily go over to your other copies that are there to keep your data highly available. So at that disaster recovery, which may be a point of you helping to build your availability solution, there's some key objectives that you'd want to think of like recovery point objective, aka how much data is the business willing to lose? Then you also have your recovery time objective, right? How long are you willing to take to bring the data back to that recovery point of objective? All this can be used with risk management to help you build a good disaster recovery plan. And the main thing I want to point out is usually backups alone will not be good enough, right? This will be your last line of defense in a disaster recovery plan. But you also may want some high availability solutions to help you make sure that you can meet your recovery time objectives. So once again, some options here where you're gonna talk about for the rest of this presentation, we'll go over log shipping, database mirroring, transactional replication, failover cluster instances, and always on availability groups. So the very first one we're gonna talk about, which is one of the easiest to implement, it's actually how I got started into high availability a very long time ago. So I once was working at a law firm and we had a goal of moving data from our primary data center over to a secondary one. And this is for a lot of our critical databases. So after hearing some ideas of, you know, maybe we could shut the servers off, put them in a truck, drive them over, you know, plug them in, power them on. I started doing some digging and I noticed that, hey, this data isn't changing a whole lot. You know, we can use log shipping and just mail over the full backups, use a diff and sync the data. And when it's time to actually go live, we could just flip a switch. Um, so every step to that process, I actually wrote, and it's out there on MS SQL tips that anyone can use if they want a step-by-step -step guide on how to do this. But the whole point that I want to talk about today is this is really just three simple steps. One is transactional log backup. So this is going to happen on your primary. This is something you should already be doing on your databases that are in full recovery mode anyway. The second two steps is going to copy those log backups over to your secondary server and then restore them. So this is good for a couple of different reasons. So you now have separate copies of your transactional log. So if a transactional log backup is lost, um, you won't be able to restore through the chain. So having multiple copies of that could be a very helpful thing for you. Also being able to have secondary copies that you can actually leverage. So for example, if I mention that disaster of the delete or update statement without the filter, that's a very large table. It could take you quite a while to restore that. You could potentially bring some of that data back online while you're doing the restore to get the deltas of what's changed since then. So all good stuff there. Um, next here, I wanna cover something that people may have forgotten or just never really fully knew about transactional log shipping here. And that is that you actually have options. If we look over at the restore step, you can see that you actually have three different options that you can perform on doing the restores. So by default, this is no recovery mode. This means your database is in a state that is not accessible, but you can restore it and bring it online. So for example, you could do restore database, database name, with recovery and it would bring that copy online. So you have another option though, which is known as standby mode. And this is a recovery option that allows you to peek or read data while it's still in a recovery state to where you can apply additional transactional logs on top of it. So if you need a poor version, poor man's version of a reporting database, this could potentially be an option for you. But from the recovery standpoint here, or high availability, this can allow you to peek and see some data before you actually bring it online. And of course, if you're gonna use standby mode, then you have, two, you have two choices where you have to make a decision. And this is when you do the restore, do we wanna kick out all users to make sure that you have the most recent data as possible? 
Or do you want the opposite of that to where you can actually leave the users connected and decide to actually attempt the restore the next time their restore job runs? The nice thing to note is all three of these steps are really just SQL agent jobs. So you can schedule them, change the time they run whenever you want. Another nice thing, which I've mentioned is you can actually then delay how often they occur. So by default, it's 15 minutes, but in the case of the very large table, you know, you can set that out to where you have a couple of hours where if you can catch a bad data change, you'll have data that you can bring back while you're doing your restore and syncing all the data. So something I recently blogged about here are some five great reasons for why log shipping should be used, especially when you're working with big databases. So once again, talking about log shipping here, the transactional log backups are occurring on the primary. It's something you already should be doing. Um, SQL agent jobs are used on the secondary servers um, for the copy and restore by default. Uh, data can be read, um, except, of course, when you are physically doing a restore. So remember, you have to pick that option of do we actually kick people out and restore to get make sure we have the latest data in there? Or do we allow those connections to persist and we retry later? Uh, keep in mind, there is monitoring that you can use as well. So you can set up thresholds to where errors will occur in your SQL error log. Or also you could set up operators and alerts based on those jobs to perform actions for when those thresholds are, are not met as well. And you can even use a whole separate monitor server for that. But speaking of monitoring, there's actually a system stored procedure that's extremely helpful. And I use this all the time when I'm working with bigger databases that I want to help keep in sync for implementing other high availability features like always on availability groups or doing a migration as well. But using this, if you run it on the primary, you can exactly see, OK, when did the last backup occur? What is the name and location of that file? Um, is it within your thresholds? And then on the secondaries, you could look at also and see, okay, which is the last one that was copied? Is it the same one as our last backup? Is that within our time there of the agent job that we want to do alerting as well? And do the same thing there on your restores. So you can get some really good insight there. In fact, I'll actually use SQL command. Um, so that way I can run this on the primary and then the secondary so I can see them all in one management studio window um, when needed to make sure that we have all of our latest log backups and they've been all restored. So log shipping pros and cons. Um, this works with standard edition. You can have multiple targets, so multiple uh, secondaries there. You can read from them. Um, you can delay restores. So I put this in bold because as we think of the data changing, this is one of the HA features that you could really leverage to help protect you against that type of a disaster, where a lot of the other ones you're going to see the data is just going to be highly available. And as you do that bad update statement, the data is going to fly across the wire. Um, it depends on your backups of primary. There's a manual failover process. So as I mentioned, if you run that restore database with recovery syntax to bring it online, if you want to switch and go back to the primary, you have to reset up log shipping for it. Um, so there's a little bit of reasonable complexity behind that. So next we're going to talk about database mirroring. Now database mirroring, there's multiple options that you can have for configuring it. Uh, we have high safety, which will be known as synchronous. So as data is getting hardened and changed in your log, it's going to be sent over the wire to the mirror. Um, you could do this synchronously with an automatic failover. If you do that, you have to have this third instance called a witness. And really all it's doing is just pinging to see if, am I able to connect to the primary? Yes, okay, so it stays online. If not, and I can connect to the secondary, then maybe we fail over automatically. So unlike log shipping where you have to manually fail over, this provides you the ability to have an automatic failover. So you can also do high safety, which would be synchronous data changes, which we'll talk a little bit more about here in a second. But you can do that without having the witness instance and it's still having a manual failover. And then, of course, we have what would be known as high performance or asynchronous. And what this does is as data is changing, that data can be hardened on the primary. And then after that process, 
it's going to be sent to the secondary and it can continue. And we'll talk a little bit about those steps at a high level here in a bit. So, for example, synchronous mode at a high level, right? You're doing your update, delete, or insert statement into the log. It's getting hardened. From that point, the data is going to be read and shipped over to the mirror. So we still haven't committed that change there. You'll see on the mirror that transaction is going to be written to the mirror. Acknowledgement will be sent back to the principal, committed on the mirror. Then the acknowledgement will go out and that transaction will be committed. So asynchronous, this is going to shorten that path of what has to happen on the principal or primary server before that data change gets committed over. So database mirroring, uh, keep in mind that it was deprecated in SQL Server 2012. It's still there in 16. Um, so when it goes away, we're not exactly sure, but that's something that's on the plan for that to maybe happen in the future. Um, database transactions are compressed and shipped to the secondary. So that's something that was added in 2008. Uh, transfer may be synchronous or asynchronous. And then, of course, you can have that optional witness to facilitate your failover. Uh, Robert Davis has a great blog post on automating quite a few things for database mirroring. So if you're a good DBA who wants to use automation to help yourself get a lot of things done, there's some great stuff there as well for you. Uh, one thing I do want to point out here is there is a little bit of warning with database mirroring and what can happen based on using the automatic failover option and having a high amount of CPU. So I have two different notices from the old books online and even a current one that I just pulled up from this morning. Um, and the whole point that they want to point out to you here is if you're going to have more than consistent 50% CPU usage, then you may have some false positives triggering failovers. So that's something you want to keep in your mind. And if you fall into that group, you may want to start looking at resource governor as a way to kind of help you with that as well. So some pros and cons here. Um, witness can be any edition of SQL Server, but remember, if you want that automatic failover, you need to have a third instance. Uh, page level corruption fixes are also a thing with Enterprise Edition that can be helpful for you. So for example, if a page gets detected and it's corrupted on the principal, but you have a good page on the mirror, it can use that to fix it. So by all means, I wouldn't use this as your whole strategy to protect you against corruption, but it's a nice bonus of this feature as well. Also, it doesn't require Active Directory. So a perfect example could be what I see with some customers that use Amazon Web Services for EC2. I see quite a few scenarios where certificates will be used, so that way um, mirroring could be used to you know, scale up or scale down on servers that you're using, as an example. Um, this is a database high level feature, just like log shipping. So you have to set this up per database and high safety is your only option on standard edition um, going up to SQL Server 2016, which we'll talk about how basic availability groups come to play and can actually allow you to do some asynchronous with standard edition. So some other things to mention here, you cannot mirror your system databases. So this is a user database thing only. Automatic failover requires the witness. You have to be in full recovery mode. And if you want the asynchronous high performance up until SQL Server 2016, you have to use Enterprise Edition. And of course, that's going over to basic availability groups. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. One thing to mention also is you have to make sure that any objects you need for that database that live outside of it are also in sync as well. So for example, jobs, logins, all that kind of good stuff. And uh, Robert Davis's link that I mentioned on a previous slide has some good stuff for helping you automate that. So next we'll talk a little bit about replication. There's quite a few different options for replication here. And so we're just going to mainly focus on transactional replication here today. Um, first thing to note is you have to actually install the bits for replication in order to use replication. So if you went through the install process and this wasn't selected, you would have to go ahead and add those bits if you wanted to use replication. So what is replication? This is basically 
a way to where you can have articles. So articles would be your database objects, for example, a table, and you can have those changes sent over to multiple subscribers. And so what happens here is there's a log reader agent, which is an executable that's actually going to read and scan your transactional log looking for changes. And as it finds them, it's going to put it into a distribution database on the distributor. So we have a publisher, which would be where your primary database is, a distributor, which could either be your publisher or subscriber, or as I would typically recommend, a completely separate instance. And subscriber here would actually be your secondary servers where you would have your database where you'd want to send these changes to. So the log reader agent on the publisher is going to get those changes. It's going to stick it in a distribution database. So that way, if your subscribers go down, come back on, that data is persisted and still could be sent over. And that process happens with the distribution agent. So the distribution agent will then say, OK, the distributor got some new data. This data hasn't been sent over to the subscribers, so now we can send it over. So kind of a great illustration from Books Online that walks you through a high level of exactly how transactional replication works. So some things to note here. You might require some changes to your actual schema. So in order to use transactional replication, you actually have to have a primary key. So if you don't have that, then that's something that would stop you from leveraging transactional replication to get those changes as they're occurring. Uh, one of the biggest benefits of transactional replication is this will allow you to keep a subset of your data highly available. So whether it's a subset of tables that you want, or maybe even a subset of data in tables, you can actually make that highly available. And like I said, transactional replication is a good way of doing that. You can replicate that out to multiple servers. And also, this is the only HA feature where you can actually use this with the simple recovery model. So you can use standard edition. Um, you have a manual failover process. Um, some people will know transactional replication to be fragile or what they'll say bugly because it's a synchronous process and data changes. So if a data change cannot go over, then that would block you and you would have to troubleshoot to move forward or use some of the features inside to go ahead and say, we want to skip certain errors if you wanted to. So it could be a little bit more complex. So next, we're going to go ahead and talk about failover cluster instances. And one of the first things that we want to point out is up until this point, we've only talked about database level protection, right? So whether you're going to use log shipping, database mirroring, or actually transactional replication, this is all something that would be set up on a per database level. Failover cluster instances now, this is actually different in the fact that it will treat your whole entire instance and give you high availability for that instance. So for example, the system databases, all your logins, SQL agent jobs, all that's going to be treated as one unit inside of a group. And it can fail over from a server or what the Windows failover cluster would call a node onto another one. So the nice thing here from your application standpoint is you'll have a cluster virtual name object. So this would be your name that would constantly be used for you to connect and get access into. So regardless of whether the instance is running on node one or node two, you use that cluster virtual name and that'll get you in. So at a high level, how does Windows SQL Server clustering work? We have what would be known as nodes. So this can be a physical server or even a virtual server, but inside of the Windows failover cluster, they would be known as nodes. Next, you're going to have your Windows cluster failover service. So this would run on each node and allow you to have a Windows cluster that you can then use to cluster groups or applications here or resources. So for example, 
By default, you'd have a Windows cluster group. So this would be the virtual name of the cluster. And if you're using Quorum, which we'll talk about in a little bit, we'll have the Quorum configurations in there as well. You can have other applications like MSDTC, SQL Server, Failover Cluster instance. And then, of course, you can have other applications as well, like a file server or other apps. And we'll talk about availability groups, too, in a little bit, as that's also going to depend on a Windows failover cluster in most scenarios. So from the workstation or end user perspective, the workstation will then connect to the virtual object for that resource or group. So, for example, for a SQL Server failover cluster instance, you will have a virtual name that you'll always connect to regardless of which server or node is connected. And then that's going to tie in through the Windows cluster to find, okay, which server is actually hosting the, the, the group and the resources that I need and be able to access them. So a couple things to note about failover cluster instances. So for today, um, we're going to talk about shared storage. So this is the common configuration, especially before SQL Server 2016. And the later versions of Windows, you have direct storage spaces that you can use. So you can actually have a failover cluster just for your high performance storage and tear it and do all that fun stuff in a Windows failover cluster and present it. For today, we're just going to focus on regular shared storage that you would constantly see in an implementation from uh, SQL Server 2012 or Windows 2012 as well. Some other nice things to note is in Windows 2012, Standard Edition actually allowed you to use failover clustering. Um, another thing some people don't know is you can actually have a failover clustered instance in Standard Edition as well. You're just limited to two nodes. And then, of course, if you remember when we went back to database mirroring and we talked about a witness as a resource being used to help detect if we need to fail over in the Windows failover clustering services, this could be done through the core mechanism as well. So taking a look here at good old SQL Server being a failover clustered instance, you can see your current status, you can see the current owner of the group. So in this case, dev SQL CLN02 is the actual node hosting the group, but all the users or applications would use dev SQL cluster name or IP to actually go ahead and access SQL Server. And that would be your client access port, which would be that virtual name and virtual IP that we see here. Next, you'd see your shared storage. So this would be your shared storage showing you all the storage that's dedicated and used by that group. And then, of course, your other resources that you would have inside of it as well. So next, talking a little bit about Quorum here, and there's a lot of great advances here with Windows 2012 and Windows 2012 R2 going over dynamic Quorum and dynamic witness configuration. We're just going to talk about the bare basics here. So, for example, you have four options that you can go with. And also, your configuration here, you'll see that there is disk majority. So this could be a shared disk or also file share majority. So you can actually use a highly available file share as you want as that extra resource to help when needed for quorum. So one of the things definitely do want to point out here is the biggest single point of failure with using shared storage in your failover cluster instance. So remember, there's only one copy of your data. So unlike log shipping or database mirroring, or availability groups, which we'll talk about in a bit here, you have one copy of your data here, where those others, you have multiple copies. So if we want to fail over from the green instance here on our left, our server, our node, you can easily do so and go over to the one on the right, right? So this can help you with high availability, help you a lot with patching. You can easily fail over back and forth between those. But if you lose your storage, your shared storage, then basically you're out of the water. There's no data to serve to your groups. So the groups are not gonna be able to really be useful for you. So you wanna make sure that you have multiple uh, IO paths there set up and that you, you have uh, redundancy in there so that way you don't 
lose your shared storage, which would be a single point of failure. So failover clustering instances, some pros and cons, right? You have multiple servers for HA. You can actually do some good patching and failover back and forth between them. Um, so you can mitigate some of that time that would cost if you're going to do patching or updates on a standalone instance where you'd have to have a dedicated time for all of that. Um, it gives you a whole entire instance protection. So remember, not just your user databases, but the whole instance, all of your server objects, link servers, everything in there would be included on it. Um, you have automatic failover, which you can leverage. And of course, those connections are transparent. Remember, we have that virtual name that you can use. Um, setup can be a little bit complex here for a DBA because you may have to get familiar with some other technologies like Windows Failover Clustering Services, Active Directory, DNS, um, Storage. Um, the other thing too, if you're going to use this on Standard Edition, you probably are going to have some idle hardware as well, right? Because you can only have a two node failover cluster instance and be active on one of them there. Um, some cases also your storage can be your single point of failure as well. So next we'll talk a little bit here on availability groups. So the following here is a layout showing you that you can have easily multiple data centers here. You have database level protection going from one to another. And the nice thing here is those databases can be put in a group. So if you have any applications that require multiple databases, you could treat that as one unit and fail over the whole group instead of just database by database level protection. So the following here is just an example here showing you that you have two different data centers. You can have a single listener name, just like with the failover cluster. So you have the same name and IP or if you have multiple subnets, different IPs, but still the same name that you can use to connect to get in. And this will sit inside of a Windows failover cluster, just like a, I'm sorry, Windows failover cluster service, just like your SQL failover cluster instance would as well. So let's go back and look at some of the challenging problems with some of the previous high availability offerings that were there inside of SQL Server. With database mirroring, you can never group databases here. So if you're gonna fail over a database, this is a per database operation. You couldn't group them based on application usage or other things that you may want to for your high availability needs in your environment. You also only get one mirrored copy. So there's just one secondary copy called the mirror, where availability groups will allow you to have multiple copies. You also have no readable copies. You know, so the data is just sitting there um, where you can't query it unless you have enterprise edition and you're gonna do snapshots and constantly manage those, which could be a pain. And of course you had to have that extra instance to trigger the automatic failover or just like a failover cluster instance with availability groups. You can actually use the quorum inside of Windows failover clustering. So some interesting problems with failover clustering, as we mentioned, you know, shared storage can be your single point of failure. Now, keep in mind, if you're doing availability groups and you only use one storage device, for all of your replicas, which we're gonna talk about, well, that's still a single point of failure based on your storage. So you wanna keep that in mind and strongly encourage that at least one of your copies of data or replicas is on some different storage to give you some protection there. Um, so also a failover clustering, remember, typically using shared storage, there's no readable copies. You just have your one instance and that moves from one server or node to another. Um, also, you know, it relies on Windows failover clustering, Active Directory, and DNS. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some improvements um, in Windows 2016, where actually you may not require to use Active Directory. So once again, to go over some of the big benefits uh, with availability groups is no shared storage. So your database level, so you're going to have a database you're gonna have copies of your data for each database on all the servers that you're using as replicas here. The listener, this is your single point of entry. So you can actually have one name that applications can use to connect to. And 
you'll have multiple replicas now. So you can actually have multiple copies that can be used in different scenarios. For example, read copies. You can have a read-only copy that can be used um, to offset some workload for doing some read traffic as well. So always on availability groups, um, enterprise edition feature up until SQL Server 2016. So you have to pay in order to use this. Um, and standard edition, uh, basic availability groups was added. And this kind of gives you a lot of the functionality and database mirroring into an availability group where you can have a single database in there. Uh, one of the big advantages I would point out is Remember before you had to have enterprise edition in order to have asynchronous data changes. You can actually do asynchronous changes on a standard basic availability group in 2016. So this uses a Windows uh, failover cluster. As I mentioned, you can have async and synchronous modes. Um, you can have your databases fail over as a group. Shared storage is no longer needed. And you can have readable copies as well. Keep in mind though, Remember our second disaster where you had a bad data change, right? That bad data change would still be highly available and get sent over to your other replicas that you have. So some more things to point out is if you are already live on your production server and you want to use availability groups over there, you have to actually go to the properties of the database engine service and enable it. Um, so this can require downtime. And then from there, here is the basic overview to point out. So here's a screenshot just showing you a setup here where we have um, a couple of availability groups. We're focusing on this one called SQL Always On. And you can see that there's two nodes or replicas here. And we can see that prod is our primary and it's up. Uh, DR, the secondary, is offline, so there's not a connection between those two at that moment. And we have multiple databases inside of this group. So you have your adventure works and for example, data warehouse, maybe an application would use those two. And it's an example of showing you that you can group them together. And we have our listener configured. So SQL 2012 always on could be the name that the applications can connect to so that way you can always get to those databases regardless of which replica is primary or not. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the configurations that you could set per your needs for your high availability in your environment. So for example, we talked about with database mirroring synchronous and asynchronous or high safety and high performance. So that's still here for database mirroring as well. So you have synchronous, asynchronous, and then if you're in synchronous, you can then use automatic failover if you choose. Um, you also have how you can connect, and of course, if you want to connect to a readable, uh, whether it's yes or no, or if you want to force a connection string to use read intent, which we'll talk about in a little bit as well. So there's quite a few great things that have been added into or improved with availability groups that could definitely help you with monitoring your solution. We've had some great sessions that you can see the recordings in to get a lot more details on these. Um, one thing I always like to point out to people is even if you just go to the dashboard and you look at the basic properties there, you can always right click on the title bar to add more things that might be useful for you. So for example, how much data needs to go through the redo process, stuff like that you can actually see in here as this dashboard refreshes. So next thing I wanna talk about is some of the enhancements. There's been a whole lot of improvements and changes that are in SQL Server 216 and potentially coming to us in SQL Server 2017. And we mentioned this because this is something that we're definitely gonna have on a roadmap for future presentations. And we've already had some that cover some of these as well. So perfect example will be distributed availability groups. Um, so we talked a little bit about availability group. Think about the ability to have availability groups of availability groups. This is something can directly impact and improve your environment if you are in a scenario where you want to have multiple data centers. 
you can actually then actually have separate availability groups in each one of them and not have to span out a Windows failover cluster across both of them. Um, so we'll have a little slide that talks about that in more detail. There is direct seeding. So in order to get that initial seeding in the past, whether you were doing mirroring, log shipping, or availability groups, you had to sync that data with restores of a full and at least a log to get the data in sync. With direct seeding, SQL Server can use VSS to actually do the syncing of the data in the background for you. So we talked a little bit about read routing. You can actually have round robin activity for connections that come in for your read traffic. So you can actually set up a mapping for your replicas when they become primary of your priority of which groups should be set up and how you can round robin between them. So we talked a little bit about basic availability group for standard edition. Um, you can actually have domain independent availability groups as well. And that's actually a feature there for Windows 2016 as well to where you can actually use certs um, instead of actually Active Directory. So if you've never used Active Directory before and you didn't want to, you don't have to spin it up just for your availability group. And then of course, there's a ton of performance improvements. Um, Jimmy May did a presentation for us not too long ago highlighting some of those. It's definitely worth taking a look at. And then of course, coming out um, eventually soon here will be SQL Server 2017. And there's a lot of great stuff there too as well. One of my favorites is resumable index rebuild. Because in the past, this would be one atomic transaction. You rebuild the index, it either all completes 100% or it gets rolled back. And this could be a whole lot of transactional log change. Um, this process actually changes and can make your life a lot better for uh, availability groups um, from that standpoint. You can also use Linux with availability groups as well. Also, I mentioned this here, um, you can have clusterless support uh, with AGs. So if you're, for example, going to set up distributed AGs, you can have a dedicated AG that could be clusterless that's really there for re-traffic. Uh, keep in mind, I mentioned this really isn't a feature for HA, and HA is not guaranteed for a clusterless AG support, but it's definitely there. And of course, you have cross-database transactions as well inside of the AG. So a lot of cool super stuff coming down the pipe. We're already been added in 16. So one of the things I wanted to point out, this is just one of many examples of how you can set up a distributed availability group. Keep in mind, this is an AG of AGs here. So here I'm basically showing that we may have a configuration already to date that has two data centers. And you can see how we're doing synchronous data changes inside of our primary database between replica or, you know, we'd say server A and server B there. So as our data is changing, that's in sync. And then we may have a second data center where that data is being changed asynchronously and it's going across to have copies of data on both replica C or D. Now, I mentioned this slide in this way because if you look at that, you can see that you have four copies of a database. And you can see that as that data is changing, it's getting sent three times. So you can see that synchronously, that data is going to change over from the replicon A and B. But asynchronously, those changes are also going to go to C and D. One of the cool things about distributed AGs is it's going to use the listener with the mirroring endpoint to send that data across. So the data will go over once. So in this example, you can see it's going to go over to instance E because that's the primary over and we'll say another data center like Azure. And then from there, that data is going to be sent. So this can also limit some of the data that can go across data centers as well. So it's some really cool stuff. Oop. So it looks like this slide is a little blended here, but so some pros and cons, no shared storage. Um, but by default, you know, definitely take a look at how you're going to architect your solution because if all of your replicas are going to be in one data center and leverage one SAN, you technically are having shared storage there. And if you lose that, that's your single point of failure. 
Um, you have readable secondaries. Uh, most of the administration is going to be doing Management Studio, um, which is nice for the DBA. So while you're probably going to have to learn a bit about Windows Failover Cluster Services, Active Directory, DNS, Storage, um, a lot of the work, including failover, would be done using Management Studio. Um, and you'll see that the configuration is not that hard. We have some great sessions recording going through step by step on exactly how you can do that. Um, you can group your databases. So a group of databases can fail over. This is an enterprise only feature up until, you know, SQL 2016, where you can have a basic availability group, which is a single database in an availability group. And it may require some code changes in your app as well for some retry logic. And with that, I'll go ahead and kick it back over to you, David, to see what kind of questions we have. Okay, we have got some really good questions. Um, first of all, we've got somebody asking you to spin up some uh, HADR remixes, so I think we'll have to work on that one for the next session. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Can the distributor also be the witness? Can a distributor also be a witness? So I just want to make sure I have the context, right? Distributor would be replication and witness is mirroring. Yep. So there are dissimilar technologies there. Gotcha. Um, so one, um, when I'm using replication, especially with quite a few configurations, I want to make that stand by itself. And one thing to mention too is really your only high availability function to date for your distribution database is a failover cluster instance. Yep. Okay, um, we got a, got a good question here. Are companies really still using replication nowadays? Uh, it doesn't seem like it's that popular. And in what cases would replication be better than some of the more common uh, other solutions? Wow, I could talk about that for quite a while. Um, that's, a, that's a very interesting, I feel like someone who knows me threw that in there just to try to get me to talk for another hour. <laughs> um, so keep in mind with availability groups, you have secondary copies, um, but these are read-only copies. So if you want to have secondary copies for very different workloads, um, Replication, transactional replication can be a very good friend for you because it's just a copy of a database that you have full control over. So different indexes, different security. If there's a lot of things that you want to change on a read copy that you couldn't, um, that could be a perfect reason for it. And yes, it is still used. Yep. The way the way I look at it, there's also another good use case. If I want to replicate some of the data in a database but not others, uh, I can elect to use different types of replication strategies to accomplish that. Yep, definitely. <clears throat> okay, got another question here. Can we have more than one database mirrored in the same instance? More than one database mirrored in the same instance. So you have multiple databases on an instance and you want to mirror it over to another instance, then yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, they're managed independently so that if one goes, they may not all go at the same time. So it's something to think about if you've got database dependencies there. Yep. Yeah, that's where AG's grouping them can be a best friend for you. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so another question here. To make availability groups work, uh, the question is, we don't need an FCI. Um, wouldn't we need shared storage for an FCI? And I'll, I'll answer this one. Uh, to make a, a non-shared storage availability group work, you need a Windows Server failover cluster, but you do not need a SQL Server failover clustered instance. So therefore, you don't need the shared storage. So arguably, it removes a lot of the complexity in there. It kind of shifts it a little bit. Yep. Yep. Any other questions? Uh, yep. Uh, let's see. If you have more than one database mirrored in the same instance, could you or should you use different ports for the mirroring endpoints? So you're going to have one port that you can configure for an instance. Now, if you're going to run say multiple instances on a host, then you would want to use a different port for each instance. 
Right, but the uh, the yeah the mirroring on one instance all goes to the same port. Yep. Okay, another good one. Um, there, are, everybody always lists great pros about using availability groups. What are some of the cons? So one that jumps out to me that I kind of see pop up quite a bit in the real world is the ability to understand the architecture and everything that's involved with running your availability group. So. For example, if you are in a shop where there is no active directory or there's not a good solid active directory admin or network admin, um, or you don't have knowledge in-house to handle DNS as well, those are some things that are definitely going to pop up and bite you. Another thing is you're kind of shifting some of um, your concerns to different areas. So when I think of mirroring or availability groups, you got to have a pretty good solid network to make sure that endpoint traffic can go, especially if you need synchronous for high availability. Um, and then, of course, you need real good storage on your log side so you can harden those changes as well. So if you don't have those, then that could be another gotchas for you as well. Perfect. Got another question. What are best practices for replicating the master database? Replicating master. So that's a system database. Um, I'm not sure I really understand the question there. If the person who asked it can provide some more contacts and even send me an email to my email address that you can see on the screen right now, uh, definitely do so and I'll make sure to touch base with you. I'm not sure where you're going or what you're looking for on that one. Uh, agreed. We've got a bunch more questions in here if you've got a few more moments. Otherwise, um, for the remaining questions, sure. uh, we'll make sure to get back to everybody. Um, if you're doing a an upgrade from SQL Server 2008 R2 or 2012, an older version up to SQL 2016, um, would you recommend using log shipping to reduce the time frame to do the migration, or do you have anything better? Um, yeah, so that's another thing I could talk about quite a bit. Um, so you have multiple options there. One thing to definitely keep in mind um, for good availability and plan of your upgrade is once you go forward, you can't go back. So when you fail over, you're actually are going to upgrade your database when you bring it online and you won't be able to go backwards. Um, but definitely to mitigate your time, I mean, I've personally done an implementation of making an 80 terabyte database highly available on that. There was no downtime. I mean, we actually were able to do it in real time, syncing the data using log shipping and be able to do it. Um, if you're only going to have one to another, I mean, mirroring could be a good way to do it as well. There's pros and cons. I'd love to talk about both. But if you're ever in a scenario where you're going to have multiple, so you're going from one to multiple instances as part of your upgrade process or high availability implementation, mirroring is only going to give you one secondary there. You know, based on a lot of the questions that we've had today, I think you and I should put together a session for using SQL Server HA features as part of an upgrade package. Oh, definitely. Um, I think that'd be really cool. This is These are great questions. Yep. Um, got another one here. Can you use replication for tables on databases inside an AG? Oh, definitely, yes. Cool. Okay, um, let's see. You've mentioned that log shipping is the only replication which can help with the delete disaster example. Um, so is it a good idea to have a log shipping server for that purpose? Uh, yes, and you, especially if you have what people would call very large databases because those are scenarios where it can take you longer to recover if you have to go through the path of actually restoring your databases. While storage is getting super cool and super fast and that time may be getting slower, depending on the size of those databases, um, that can still be something that doesn't meet your recovery time objectives. Exactly. Okay, with balancing read traffic in an availability group, uh, do you mean that the query cost will be split between replicas to get faster results? Um, I can answer that one. It's not we wish, but it. unfortunately, no. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wish you could go active, active and actually split the queries between instances. That would be really cool. But, but only when it benefits you, though. Keep that in mind, David. Oh, of course. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Uh, no, unfortunately, with this one, it'll basically take the query itself and push it to one of the replicas. Uh, otherwise, you know, it, it can't really fork it that way. It would be really cool if it could. <laughs> 
Yep. Okay. And then we got another question here. I'm gonna I'm gonna say this whole this other question should be a whole other presentation from one of us. Um, what's the best way to accomplish HADR within an Azure VM? Gotcha. Yep. So I think we're going to take both of those and run yeah, with those. Tell you what, that'd be a great if there's a way for us to do like a joint virtual chapter to where we can interact with the cloud VC and kind of do a both of us getting together. That would be a great way to, to kind of have two VCs hammer a great topic. Yeah, well, let's tell you what, let's work on that through email. That that'd be a great full you know hour, honestly, a part one, part two, because oh, yeah. there's so much there to talk through. Um, and there's a whole bunch more here. Um, uh, on that topic, so we'll, we'll table those for this other one. Um, we've got a few more questions here. Um, see, there's one that's specific here. Do we have a session to talk about using a VM, and this one's specific to VMware, Site Recovery Manager for a database server for HA purposes? Uh, um, I can address this one real quick. Using that particular function, which is an orchestrator for SAN level replication, um, using that for HA may not meet uh, your your SLAs. So specifically the RTO, the RPO could be synchronous or asynchronous depending on how you're setting this up. So there might be no data loss. It may just take a moment to have stuff fail over and come up. Um, feel free to contact me uh, just at, at my home website, just david at davidclee.net, and I'd love to talk with you more about that one because there's some nuances there to really worry about. Um, one more here, and the gentleman just left, but do you have a good article for how to sync logins, jobs, alerts, things like that through the different uh, HA solutions? Uh, yes, and the one in the deck, um, which we'll make available to Robert Davis, where he goes over automating some tasks for Mary, um, that's a great one for that as well. Okay, cool. Um, Let's see, two more questions here. If your file share witness goes down along with your sync replicas, will you still be able to switch over to the async replica? If, can you repeat that one, David? Yes, if your file share witness, basically, basically if your primary site goes down, mm -hmm. can you fail over to the async replica? So file share witness uh, and both synchronous replicas. So, first of all, the greatest SQL Server answer ever is it depends. One, is the Windows failover cluster still online, or did you lose enough votes to where the, the whole failover cluster is brought down? Um, so that would be one. And, of course, that's something someone can email me. I could go a lot over in a lot more details, and that also changes based off of what version of Windows you're using. Um, so... Yeah, that's one that I'll pull up here and I'll make sure that I respond to you to make sure that give you a better answer for your environment. Perfect. Um, so last question in an HA config with uh, two nodes, and I don't know if this is a failover cluster instance or an AG sitting between two locations. If site A and the witness go offline, would it fail over to site B? What it's, what are its impact on HA? I can answer part of this one for you. Um, in an HA config, if they are synchronous and they're configured for automatic failover, those should just fail over and work. If they're set up for asynchronous, that's a manual failover. Uh, so it, it wouldn't automatically go over, but you would still be able to bring it up. And once again, the same point there that if your Windows failover cluster service is running. Um, so if you get to SQL Server 2016 and you're able to use distributed AGs, that's something that can be a super cool, helpful resource if you have multiple data centers. Um, so that way, really only the data that's being sent from the mirroring endpoints is sent. And you can have separate AGs and kind of mitigate some of those pain points with multi-subnet heart beating and all that stuff as well. Exactly. Um, and uh, Karthik, I will reply to yours here in just a moment. I think that'll do it. Cool. So thank you, John. And uh, what we'll do, we'll get this recorded. We'll get this posted online. Any questions that anybody has on this topic, or just like you saw with the questions here, uh, feel free to send over questions, send over topics that you'd love to see, uh, because these are these are great questions, these are great comments, and honestly, about half of the questions in here we can make full hour sessions off of. Yep. We love the topic. Uh, it's why we do what we do.
So feel free to send them over. And uh, thanks, everybody, for attending. We'll see you all next month.